It's interesting that Margie, the only cripple in the class who can't use her right arm, was the only one who did any homework. I find that very curious. So I should be particularly considerate in the critique. But circumstances don't allow it. You're in, I suspect, the key of yellow green. Yeah. I never would have imagined that. <laughs> You're using too much yellow green. Well, it's the color of the apple, so. No, it's not the no. color of the apple. No. Okay. <laughs> no. The apple is going to have all the colors that you have in a color sphere. It's going to You have the light coming from the upper right at 45 degrees. Your highlight is going to be a neutral. You want it to have a little bit of cool in it, that's all right, but it could be a dead neutral. And the light is going to be warm and it's going to be yellow orange and very low in intensity. Because that's the light source. In the half tone, you're going to get your yellow green, and it too will be low in intensity. It's in the shadow. It's on the way to shadow. Then you're going to have a reflected light coming in here that could be. I could you could even make it a low intensity red violet. Hmm? And then what's left could be blue violet low intensity but you've only got one area really where you have the local color of your yellow green apple yeah yeah because yeah. it's not what you see when you look at it well In that way, it wasn't what i was seeing so i was having trouble identifying body color which is why I did the tonal study first, because like, I was trying to decide about like separating value from temperature. And I was having trouble confusing those things and, and not being able to dissect what I was seeing. So this is very informa good information. I, I, will, I will insist that you take my copy of the Andre Lot because he discusses this at some length. There's a book by Homer called The Art and Science of George Seurat. I have to look up the title. We have it here. Who did I show it to? Lacey. She may have it upstairs. These are givens. These are givens. The, the light source, artificial or natural, Andre Lott will say orange. Others will say yellow orange. I, I tend to say it's yellow, yellow orange, which means that the shadow side will be cool and it will be the split complement of your yellow orange, which will be a red violet or violet. So immediately these things set up, simultaneous contrast immediately dictates that this is how things go. And if you learn to see, because you know what to look for, you know how to squint to simplify things, you know, you know that you don't want the light to be too strong, you don't want it to be a spotlight, you want it to be a floodlight so it's got a soft edge on the shadows. The 45 degree angle light is the Rembrandt lighting it puts the core of the shadow in a third, and yours runs too close to the half. Okay. And if you divide it dead center vertically, 45 degrees, it doesn't matter what, it's a straight line. It really it's a straight line. It's a straight line. Mm -hmm. When you reticulate a sphere, the front 
edge of it will have a straight line. Or you leave it out and there'll be curved lines on either side of that negative space that hasn't a line in it, all right? Remember, we are not painting what we see. We are painting what we've learned will work and read for the layman as our subject. We know that we, through trickery, have to contrive to make it look volumetric, even if it's on a two, even since it's on a two-dimensional surface. So we've got to exaggerate. We've got to uh, emphasize that which will help to make that look volumetric, and edit out anything that's going to flatten it out. And we want it to be warm in the light and cool in the shadow, with a warm reflected light. Well, if the shadow's cool. A neutral in the shadow area will look warm because of simultaneous contrast. And if the light area is warm, because it's going to be taking on the color of the source, the light source, if the highlight's neutral in that field of warm, it will look cool. So we don't have to use a whole lot of strong color. And the cast shadow will tend to be cool. And if there's a substantial reflected light there, it too is going to be warm. Even if you don't put warm paint in there, but you put a neutral in there. Then I beg you to make certain that you've set up your still life so that the colored papers you use or the paint you use in painting the environment are drawn immediately from your color wheel. Hmm? Immediately. So if you're painting something that's predominantly in the light warm. Sure, go ahead, a blue violet and a green, a blue violet ground plane because it's warm. The coolest point is blue green, so blue violet is closer to red orange than is green, do you see it? So you make this on the ground plane so it comes forward, and that's what you've done. You put the warmest here but it's much too intense. Yeah. Much too intense. I can see that. Your, 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 your apple is too local. You're saying the apple's yellow green. I said it isn't. Okay. But you've so ignored, you've ignored I, me. I, I feel terrible. I'm not about. sure I remember hearing it. It was probably all the pain medication. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so could I do some correction through an overpainting? Sure, this? sure, yeah. So I could try just like Yeah, but it would, be be it would be better if you started from scratch. Okay. And if you corrected the core here, you redrew that cast shadow so that it fell down here and wasn't so... See, it shouldn't be way up there, and it shouldn't give you that little gutter between the okay. shadow and the yep. background. If you repaint that, mm -hmm. you move this core so it's fuller and a more accurate ellipse, okay. and it's in further into the third... You blend out this dark halo, which is drawing attention to itself because it's light on either side of it, mm -hmm. making so it a dark blending. figure. Blend it out so that it, mm -hmm. it's dark only up against this edge and immediately becomes lighter and then finally darker for the vignette. Mm -hmm. Your vignette draws attention to itself because it's too sudden mm -hmm. and your contrast here is too great. You squint. And this pops, do you see it? Yeah. That pops. So you've got to drop your lights down so they don't compete with the lightest lights on your subject. And you want to lighten your darks so they don't compete with the darkest dark because there's a point here where that's as dark as anything in the shadow side and the volume of reflected light falling into that would have lightened it. Okay, but probably your paper was so dark was too dark and you couldn't that see that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is too intense. Mm -hmm. I've recommended that you get Canson uh, My Tint pastel paper because they have a range of very, very, very muted neutrals. Mm -hmm. The widest range of, of colors you can find, probably a Dick Blake, that are muted and quiet enough. or you mix up acrylics and you paint the environment you're going to set your still life up in. And I think with all the information we have about color theory, that makes the most sense. 
And I've said that should you do that, what you're going to discover is a range of color you've never experienced before in your life because the warm light, the, the cool cast shadows, the colored papers, the fact that they're all based on Fletcher's color key, things are going to happen to prove uh, the truth of Chevril and all of the color theorists' research. Those things will happen. And then the beautiful thing about the Fletcher wheel is that he shows you how you can reduce of the hundreds upon hundreds of pigments that are available to the painter today in the color shows. You can reduce your palette to three colors and white. Wow, what a gift. You know, I heard my teachers at the Ruskin and I've heard other teachers in this country telling students to go out and buy a bunch of colors they like. An experiment, do rows and rows and rows and rows of color. Well, there's no form, there's no order, there's no relationship. It's busy work. They do tints and they do tones. They read Itten, they read Albers. No, none of which is giving you any approach that's cohesive and useful. Fletcher does, he does everything you need. So he's saying, if you have these three colors, they're primary in that they're full intensity when you lay them out. Of course, what I ask you to do is to get an orange, you mix a red orange and a yellow orange together so it's not as strong as it would be out of a tube. And you want to reduce the power of your color, not increase it. However, if you mix the orange with the, with the green, you're going to get a, a yellow. But neutral is here. So, if we come straight down, and our neutral is at this point, that is where this mix falls, and that, according to Fletcher, is a very low intensity yellow. Do you see it? Its proximity to neutral means it's very neutral. And when you look at it, you won't recognize that it's yellow until you add a good deal of white to it. And then you remember I've told you that the yellows go from cadmium yellow light to a mix of cadmium yellow and yellow ochre. And below that is raw sienna with some cadmium yellow and a little yellow ochre. And below that is raw umber. Boy, that's really going down, dark, dark, dark. And I've used the analogy that if you look at the shoreline at a good beach, I recommend Old Orchard Beach in Portland, Maine, because that's where I grew up. And at low tide, there are seasons in my memory of childhood when it must have been a mile from the sand down to the water. But what it gives you is the yellow of the sand where it's dry. And as it gets wet, as you get closer and closer and closer to the water, it's going to go from a, a, a light yellow to uh, something that's closer to raw sienna. And then it's going to start through the raw umbers and go down and down and down. But those dark yellows are the raw sienna and raw umber. Hmm? So they are yellow. So you have a secondary mixture here, which is low in intensity. And this is four steps. This is a four, three, five triangle, which is a golden section triangle. Then if you mix blue violet with orange, it's going to be even closer to neutral. It doesn't look at here. One, two, three, four, five intervals. It should be closer, all right? It will be even weaker, and it will fall between red, violet, and red. 
It'll be a red, red violet if you're, if you're boxing the compass, all right? And, of course, if you mix green with blue violet, we've only got three steps. At that point, it's going to be very powerful. Also, the greens and the blue violets tend to be colors with more staining power than the cadmiums and some of the reds. Hmm? So, now you've got a triad and three secondary colors. You've got six colors and you have neutral. And you can move this neutral into any quarter and you can shift it from being very, very warm to very much cooler. To cool this because that's closest to blue-green, which is your coolest point. So then Fletcher says, okay, this is five intervals. So the colors you're going to get along this line are going to be less intense he says, I shall give you, I'll give you a red-violet. That means you can get blue-violet and red-violet, and you can get a very strong violet. You can mix red-violet with orange, and you can get a much more intense red or red-orange. And then he says, he's given you yellow, so you can get a strong yellow-orange yellow, a yellow orange and a strong yellow-green. And this is already quite strong. So he says, the next thing he's going to give you is a set of complementary opposites. So really, you've got five colors and neutral. Because the complementary opposites you might not ever need. Boy, when you consider all the chaos that exists in most palettes. You go through any art school and look at the palettes, and I assure you, you're not going to see anything very attractive. You're going to see mud. What I've called cacadoua. Mm -hmm. You're going to see mud. Because these kids don't know what they're doing. And very often their teachers have told them, if you mix complementary opposite colors, and some of you have had that advice in art school, you can get nice grays. No, the truth is if you mix colors that are divided by five intervals on this wheel, you can get some pretty nice grays, the best of grays. But direct opposites give you mud. They don't give you anything. So if you want a transition that goes from yellow to violet, you mix the yellow with the central neutral. And when you get to the intermediate point between the two colors, and you've got a pure neutral, then you can start adding violet slowly to it until you can intensify that. And you have not mixed color from this side to that. So, returning to your piece, the subordinate colors are much too intense. Mm -hmm. They're too dark. Yeah. Which raises the question, uh, what kind of a mood did you want in your piece? You really didn't think about it. Well, actually, I did, and I don't think I succeeded. <laughs> All right. The colors, the, the local colors, were pleasing to me, and they were intense. They were all pretty intense, but the apple was so much lighter and brighter and shinier and all of that. that you know, I, what I thought was that because of its lighter value and these darker, intense colors, that it would be, you know, an intense grouping of colors, but that the apple would because it was lighter and I was hoping to render it well and choose the right colors, that I would get that pop, sort of, that the apple was in this intense setting. But what I didn't get was, you know, how to right. make that. <laughs> what, I, what, I, what I said was, what I feel you didn't do was, uh, thank you very much. What I said you, you didn't do was uh, create a mood. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the things you could have done to create more of a mood would have been to have not crowded the apple in a small space, mm -hmm. given it a little bit more air, a little bit more area to relate to. It would, have it would have allowed you to make more transitions from one side to the other and to have made something that was high key, which would mean a blonde painting, 
a la Morandi, and I showed you lots of blonde Morandis. I showed you um, others that were very, very blonde. There was a Mayo beach scene with a stone wall and a shed behind it. Or you could work in a very low key with dark neutrals that were very low in intensity and you could get something of a feeling of something somber from that. So mood could be high key, middle key, or low key. But I don't think you'd want, even in a middle key, a great deal of contrast in value or a, re a limited range of colors that were all too intense. And that's their own You've committed time. every sin. Every you could, you, every one of them. You haven't missed a base. I'm so happy I could give you all this material to work with. <laughs> I had no idea what I was going to lecture on tonight, and now I have a subject. <laughs> now you have. So if you go back now and you increase the size of the area that you're going to put the apple in, if you lighten the subordinate elements in it and reduce their intensity, probably move your light a little farther away and arrange it so that your shadow falls lower. Are you with me? Lower. And yes. occupies less space mm -hmm. and doesn't crowd the vignette so that you get this light halo around, yes. which is surrounded by darks. And this pops forward when it shouldn't. It should be a plane. And it should look farther away here, so it should be much less intense there, more intense here, and less contrast there, and quieter, so that you didn't have almost black and white in some of these places throwing it forward. Then artists tend to, when they approach the edge, and you've heard me quote Cezanne, he says, the edge eludes me. And what he's meaning is, there is no edge. The form is turning away from you. Artists, when they do a far cheek, show you all kinds of thin layers, but there is no edge. There is no hard edge. Sure, Gauguin, Van Gogh, others, Basile, that period of post-impressionism, they're actually drawing lines there because of the influence of Japanese prints that have flooded Paris and had an impact on the Impressionists and the Post-Impressionists. So there's some place between graphic designers, as it were, and painters, and they're no longer realists. The technique is taking over, and it's not surprising that they were followed by the Futurists and the Fauves and the Vorticists and all of the different movements that happened, none of which lasted more than a year or two. I mean, we, the 19th and late 20, 19th and early 20th century was absolute chaos. And art, art instructions never recovered from all that because art instruction took a body blow, a crippling body blow. Nobody knew what to teach. So you, you have these outrageously hard edges. And you've added insult to injury by drawing an, an actual line around it with a fine brush. I mean, if it wasn't sharp enough, I sharpened you sharpened it. Yeah, you did well. I'd like you to rework it. Rework it. And reread the Andre Lot because do two things. Reread, read the Andre Lot, and I'd love you to go to the Metropolitan. And I'd like you to spend time with the 19th century French room and then go in a spiritual frame of mind and watch, look at the Dutch still life painting. Some are super realists, but there are a few that are brilliant value masters and you can walk into those pieces. They're just absolutely incredible. The degree of realism they bring isn't something I'd wish to burden you with. But look at how magnificently they cause everything to look as if it exists in a kind of air. 
And it's Degas who said, but it's not the kind of air we breathe. It's a, it's a real, at, it's a painterly atmosphere. They sit on planes that extend into space. They're solid and they have volumes and they're at a distance from everything else around them. And look for the arabesques and all of the devices that they use and you probably, you should bring a gauge with you and it would be ideal if you put that gauge on a piece of what is the plastic that's transparent? Mylar. Not mylar, something stiff. STG. No, something thicker. Comes in sheets. This is, this is, what is this stuff? Plexiglass. plexiglass. Wow. Make a plexiglass gauge with the right angle and your angles. And hold it up, one eye, decide what the rectangle is. And then draw that rectangle and start to analyze putting the grid on it, what the designer is doing. It'll be by far the richest experience you'll ever have in a museum. Then because you're in the 19th century room where color has come alive, decide what the triad is, what the key is, what the subordinate colors are, and start to examine the neutrals because what you're gonna be shocked to discover is that the whole painting, which struck you as being powerful color, is gray. Everything is a tertiary gray. Everything has been reduced in intensity. And because of the split complementary underpainters, because of the juxtaposition of split complementary opposites outlining each of the major objects in rich, richer color, it gives you the impression of very intense color. But you look at the Monets that you think are so intense, you look at the Cayabots, and you're gonna be startled to see how intermixed they are, how neutral they are. You, you have no trouble seeing this in Vuillard and Bonnat in the Intimists, you know. They really reduced everything in intensity. But so too did Monet. No, Monet and Manet, they just didn't paint with high intensity color. Even the strongest things they did weren't raw, ever. So, returning to the Fletcher, what you've been asked to do is mix most of these colors early on in this course. And I think you'll all agree you discovered colors you didn't know existed. Hmm? And you now knew where they fell, and you now knew what they were, and you will see them when you go to the Met. You will see them when you go to the Boston Museum of Fine Art. You won't in the National Gallery, because the National Gallery, there is some modern painting, but most of it is classical and Baroque, and of a previous age when people were mixing black with everything to get their blues, they had low intensity earth colors that hadn't changed much since the days of the Egyptian wall painters. So it was the industrial revolution that provided us with all of this color that Fletcher has shown you how to tame, employ, and, 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 and control. Remember, you need a brush to work in this, field, a different brush to work in this field, and a different brush to mix in that field. Yes? How would you make an orange without using cadmium orange? You could mix cadmium red, cadmium yellow into burnt sienna to raise the burnt sienna so it could hold its own with yellow ochre or more cadmium orange and cadmium red if you wanted to raise it to hold its own with cadmium yellow and cadmium green. Are you with me? So it's a matter of tuning. I did give you printout pages and I listed the colors that would be high intensity, middle high, middle low, and low. 
don't lose that. But you should by now know, know that. You should know that. So, as I said, I want you to put these wheels on the wall if you have a studio. They're up. They're, they're up and they move. And then, you're going to see tonight, I'm going to be showing you some work by Dot Bun. And I'll, I'll introduce you to who she is in a moment. And each one of her paintings shows you the interior triangle. She never points it in the right direction for some strange reason. And she'll be shocked when she sees this video and hears that criticism. But uh, she shows that in a triangle each time she starts developing her subject from digital photographs that she has altered on Photoshop. So her approach is to living in North Bucks and the bulk of her clients, and she has many, and the bulk of the galleries that are showing her work, and there are quite a few, are local. And New Hope was the center for New York Impressionists and Post-Impressionists. And it remains something of an artist colony today. Downtown has degenerated. It's now a third-rate tourist trap. But years ago, there was a real collection of people, art historians and writers and playwrights and important composers of musical Broadway and lyricists, everybody was living in New York because it was so close to New York. And it was such a lovely piece of countryside and it was so unspoiled. And it's still relatively unspoiled and it's a lovely place to go on a weekend. So she takes a photograph and she alters its proportions on Photoshop, expanding, contracting, elongating. She manipulates the values. And then she has a series of printouts in which she starts manipulating the color. She leaves these as scans and files, and then from certain printouts, she starts drawing and transforming them on a golden section grid. And it's at this point that she starts introducing arabesques, asserting a dominant vertical, a dominant horizontal, a dominant diagonal, a dominant arabesque, a dominant movement. She starts editing and, editing and reducing the number of trees in one area and increasing the number in another. She redraws, when she's working with an open river, and organizing the overlapping and moving shifts of direction in the underlying stone seen through the water, in the reflections on the surface of the water, so that everything is following a movement an arabesque. She does an enormous amount of manipulating. And she does a very elaborate grisaille so that she has organized the geometry or drawing of the piece. Then she reduces it to a value study. Again, editing, emphasizing, subduing, increasing the contrast of various areas, softening edges, and then she finally puts a complementary underpainting and an overpainting, and she's done. And luckily, she's been kind enough to give me scans of a number of her pieces that I can show you, and it also gives me an opportunity to apply some of the theory that we've been discussing and haven't had too much practice, or even though it was built into my assignments, with actual painting a subject, not a realistic subject. I think I've given you a foundation that will allow you to see color in a subject. 
choose a suitable key, mix up a limited number of colors, and do your underpainting and overpaintings intelligently and in an organized way. That was the purpose of the course. That was information that I didn't get in art school. Excuse me, I can't hear you. Is the goal to actually plot out your underpainting and overpainting by drawing it the way that you had us do in our assignments in terms of this? Like, should we have drawn that and then drawn it like three times? And then one of those would be where you plot out. Was, is that the goal to kind of plot out the underpainting and do it with all of those symbols and then do another one? with the plan for the overpainting, and then do the actual mixing of the colors of painting, right? So in other words, that's the process to approach any kind of a painting. Yes and no. Initially, what I would like you to do is have some reference material. Could be that you have a site that you visited, there's a view that you admire, you photographed it, you've, you've done some color studies there, you've done some drawings there. So now you're in a position where you have enough information about your subject to be able to go home, put your, your scans from your camera on your, on your computer, and you can make prints now of the subject. And you can decide what you're going to do for a rectangle. And you can start analyzing your subject and figuring out with the grid for that rectangle how you're going to design it. So now you're selecting, you're editing, you're emphasizing, you're exaggerating, you're, 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 you're developing a plan. Once you have that, you can start printing those. You can, you can scan that, put it in your computer, you can print that on good paper, and you can now start doing color studies on top of it. You can do value studies on top of the paper in oils. I mean, these are not permanent. These are just ways of you covering a wall with all of your options available to you, okay? You put them up on the wall, you go for a walk, you prefer dinner, you come back the next day or two days later and you look at it and you, you have a, you're able to stand back and see it afresh and decide, well, some of these are effective and some are not, so I'm gonna put up only the strong ones and I'm beginning to see what I want to do with this subject. And now you can start doing your master cartoon. The drawing you'll transfer to your canvas or your hardwood support. And you have your value studies and you know what key you're in, you know what colors you're using. You might explore that a little bit more on sketches, rough and dirty sketches. But then you should be able to start painting and you've made all your big decisions without actually plotting out the numbers, the values. You don't need to. You don't need to. You, can have do you could have done that when you were on the site. Right. You, could, you could have your sketch and you could put, this is a red violet, number three value, middle intensity. It's all worked out already. Yeah, you've got all of this. You don't have to replicate it. Now you can start translating that into color. First of all, you translate it into value. Uh, Corot told Pizarro, he said, I use 24 values from white to black. It's a lot. And he said, believe me, value is the most important thing to the painter. More important than color. Isn't that interesting? And without a good value scheme, you're in trouble.
you're in trouble. And the best thing for it is to always keep your values very close. Decide you want a mood. And you don't get a mood with, with strident value contrast, black and white. That screams. Well, that's the mood. It's angry. It's violent. You want to do a piece that's uh, going to allow somebody to sit with it in a room and watch it in different kinds of light and find it contemplative and restful, pleasing, perhaps beautiful. Hmm? None of that. They say you can't make love with a clenched fist. Well, you know, you just can't be in that violent frame of mind, be it accents, strong triangular accents. There's nothing restful. You assemble a whole bunch of triangles, it looks like cats screaming at midnight, keeping you awake, you know? So you need a quiet line system, you need a quiet series of value relationships, you need harmonious colors that are either all warm with a cool note, or cool with a warm note, maybe in transition going from warm to cool and being adjusted in that way. But mood usually requires that it's sunrise or sunset, it isn't full noon, and it's quiet. And this is what I think you're striving for. Now, if you want to be more violent and romantic, and you're thinking of Van Gogh, and you're thinking of Chaim Sartin, you're thinking of Venetians like Tintoretto, El Greco, these are very, very strong, powerful, violent paintings. I mean, El Greco's Assumption of the Virgin, she's in a state of ecstasy that most people don't get close to except in sex. And there's no question about the fact that he had heightened sexual arousal in mind because no other state of mind would have communicated the energy or expressed what it might have felt like to be in the presence of God. You'd be twisted out of shape. Your system would have shorted. It would be like being struck by lightning. So where do you go to, to find that mood? You have to go to an extreme situation. Maybe the battlefield. You've got to find a metaphor. Yeah, I think if somebody is going to do a poem, they do many drafts. They're going to write a book. They do many drafts. Beethoven and Mozart were reputed to have done 20 or 30 drafts of every movement for every symphony and every musical piece they did. Nothing comes easy. And you can be suspicious of that which comes too easily. And you don't want to stay too close to it for so long. You want to put it aside, distance yourself from it, and come back and be able to look at it afresh. Hmm? We've talked about all the the funny games people play and funny devices they use to distance themselves from having become too closely involved with something to be even able to see it. Some people talk about how their spouses are their eye. They come in and, and they're not involved and they can see more quickly what isn't working and what is working for that matter. Provided you're on good terms. Don't invite them in after a family argument. You know? So let's look at some of Dot Bun's pieces. And I'm going to ask you, when we're looking at them, to ferret out the design devices she's employing with regard to line composition, value composition, color composition. So the more you people can volunteer, I think the more interesting the session will be. This first slide is of a piece, a Conti drawing by 
Christy Brusenak, who's currently a professor in the foundation department of Savannah College of Art and Design, where I believe she's in really good standing and a highly respected professor. This is an illustration from Bible texts. She's a very devout Christian. And she's found imagery that allows her to work in a semi-abstract method and let her readings of the Bible stimulate the emotional content and the intellectual content of her pieces. So this is a low key value study that is keyed by a few light accents. If you hold two fingers up and cover all of the lights, you'll see how subordinate and closely related everything is until you introduce the lights and then the background looks very much darker by virtue of the lights and simultaneous contrast of value. And we now see the triangle she's using against the vertical. So we have all of these arcs sweep, sweeping up from the main stem. And then we have this triangle pointing up. And we have the sense of movement upward that any growing plant would offer. I think it's framed so that it looks as if it's a boss at the end of a cone, because this looks like it might be the base of a cone. You see what I'm saying? And it comes forward. I think these follow pretty much the same program, except now she's placed all of this ahead of that quieter, low-key background. You see it. Mm -hmm. This is all over, and the background is light, making this backlit. Mm -hmm. This is backlit, but not as aggressively. And this is a light figure on a, ground, on, a, on, a light, on a dark ground. I'm showing them to you because I really think you need to do value studies before you start a painting. Now, I must tell you that when Seurat does a value study, they're very dark. But if he does a value study for a painting, when you see the painting, it's usually very light. Now, this is a consequence of his respect for the drawing tool he uses, which is the same as the tool that Christie's using, a Conti pencil. A Conti pencil makes a greasy, black, dark mark. If you want a blonde drawing, you prepare a panel and you use silver point. And the silver point, because you've bought a wire of silver from a, from a silversmith and you put it in a pencil holder and you sharpen it to a needle point and you have a gesso prepared piece of paper or panel and when you draw on it you can almost barely see the line but you know that silver tarnishes. So the longer you leave it exposed to the air the darker the line will become. And when you're satisfied that your drawing is rich in contrast enough, you fix it. You spray it so that it no longer tarnishes, no longer darkens, and you have a very blonde drawing. If you work with hard graphite pencils, you get very blonde drawings. So what you're essentially doing is choosing the appropriate medium or tool given your plan. So you have to have made up your mind that you want to do a blonde drawing or a, a middling sort of value drawing.
or something very dark and quiet and somber. And then you have the right to choose the suitable ground you're going to work on, the suitable pencils you're going to use, etc. So he's, she's choosing a Conti pencil, which makes a very dark, dark mark. This shows you the golden section grid underneath this abstraction of a tulip. Do any of you wish to comment on it? It would make a great stained glass window. It would make a great stained glass window. And this was how she interpreted it in oils. I think it went too dark. Here it's emitting light, it glows. The first one has almost, it almost seems like a light source within it. Exactly. And that one does not, the second one does not. It looks more like an object. During, yeah, during the 16th and 17th century, artists like Rembrandt, Franz Hals, and their contemporaries, Rubens, did this. When they painted portraits, they made the flesh very, very much lighter. And what they were seeking to convey was that the light of the individual's soul, their spirituality, was illuminating them. And like a light bulb, they glowed. So it was a metaphor at a time of great religious enthusiasm for a highly religious view of a person and their soul. So you could use it as she's done here effectively and here not so effectively. So my purpose in showing Christy up front was that I want to stress the importance of doing a pencil value study or an oil painted value study. This is the work of Sid McGinley, and I don't have anything current. These are much older pieces. She's a pastel artist, and she's considered one of the 150 national pastel masters. She's been featured in all the pastel magazines. She's represented in Philadelphia by the Artist House Gallery. And people don't believe what she's doing is pastel. They imagine that they're oils. Brilliant, brilliant work. What key is this in? Blue? I don't think so. I think that Sid thought so, but I don't think so. Yellow, green. Remember the rule. The rule is we imagine a painting is a choral group. And the members of the chorus are all wearing dark colors. And the soloist steps out in a white gown and is immediately identified as being the leader and being the one who will sing the solo. So the minority entry here is yellow-green, which is the split complementary of red-violets and blue-violets. And if you squint, you'll discover that as blonde as that is, it's very intense, seen up against the reinforcement of the blue violet and the red violet. Do you see what I'm what I'm suggesting? Can you see that? Marge, you don't look as if you agree. I agree about the color key though. I, I wanted to say blue first because it's the one that sort of sings out, but the one that really makes it work is the yellow or the yellow green. 
Yeah. It's, it's hard in this one, I think, because there's so much color, and that blue is so intense, and it's sort of screaming at us. Could be, but if you squint, it's very close in value to everything else. Yeah. It's almost that value here, and you see it. Mm -hmm. So if you squint, this is a dark form. Yeah. This is very neutral. And it's warm. Everything in here is warm. There are some greens, some blue greens. But it's still flesh tones. It's still fairly warm. What's happening here? No. No, all of these warm colors are uh, forcing this forward as your keynote. Also, now th the bathtub, the cools in the bottom of the bathtub really help that to work in the shadows. They do. They do. I feel that there's too large an area for the key color. But then, look, people take this information and they use it to suit their own interests, and this is what Sid is doing. So it's not a matter of... I believe it's the blue, the blue-green, yeah. But I, I think if you were to cover all of this with three fingers, you'd see how much, much nicer that is where you've got a small area up against all that warm. And as you draw your hand down and add more cool, it cancels out the uniqueness of the blue. So my principal recommendation is keep your key color to no more than about 10 or 15% of the whole piece. Then you'll have a warm painting with a cool note. Here, you have a strident warm and a strident cool. You don't have a mood. There isn't really any atmosphere in this. This is very decorative two-dimensional color. It's reminiscent of Matisse. Late Matisse. Great large areas of strong color. And uh, I find it less pleasing than less intense colors and a diminished area of the key color on a split complementary ground. I'd say this is the most successful of the pieces we've seen because now the use of the key color is subordinated. If you squint, it's close in value to these darks, so that it's a quiet enhancer of all of those warms. It isn't too aggressive, and it's functioning as a keynote. And a keynote doesn't necessarily mean that it's where your eye goes, but it's the entry that brings a spike to everything else. In a dark painting, it's the light note that makes the darks ring. In a warm painting, it's the cool note that reinforces the richness of the warms. This has atmosphere. It's a little difficult because of the intensity of all the color, but it has more atmosphere than any of the pre previous pieces had. And the drawing is wonderfully broad and simple. And it's uh, amazing how little modulation you need in the figure. People use such a range of lights and darks, and when they do... Lord. When they do, they lose this kind of unity. Do you see it? So you can just work in a more blown fashion. What do you have to say about this? Blue is the key now. Oh, yeah. I think it's too intense. Cover it. And nothing, nothing in all of those quiet, muted colors and grays 
suggest what you're going to get when you remove your hand. It's just way over the top, isn't it? It could have been no more intense than that and worked very nicely. I can't wait to see what Marge is going to do with her, with her stained glass. I have a feeling these things are going to have an influence. What do you think? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's going to be very interesting. Lauren? I, think a, I have two commissions that are waiting for me that I'm already rethinking completely. <laughs> Maybe redesigning them and resubmitting them. So you look at things in new ways. I haven't looked very carefully at stained glass windows. I know that there have been some modern stained glass windows by, commissioned by great modern artists. If you have some books of modern stained glass, examples that you greatly respect, please bring them in. I'd be fascinated to see them. I'm. I'm just ignorant. I don't know. I haven't had reason to look. This I'm pleased with because of all these neutrals. They have gone a, a long way to softening and creating a greater sense of atmosphere. This blows it. It's a shame. Even the values in the torso are excessively intense. This is the work of Judy Fritchman. Recently, this was shown in the library at Brynathen at the Swedenborgian campus. We have a number of Swedenborgian churchgoers because there's a Swedenborgian chapel and group in Kempton, which is a small community west of the Lehigh Valley, and uh, Abysinovitz was part of that community, is still part of that community. So is the key of sort of yellow or yellow orange? Yeah. Yeah. This is the strongest interaction, isn't it? Hmm? These are the strongest value contrasts. This is the strongest color interaction. All of this is much subordinated. Do you see it? I'm bothered by the intensity of the color in the legs and the feet. It draws my eye away from the interaction of the women and their faces and their hands. Those very intense colors in their feet. That's just... I tend to agree with you. Cover them. Yeah, see, I don't want to look at their feet. I want to look at their hands and their faces. I think that um, what else is causing that to be? There's a lot of contrast there. There you go. 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 Yeah. It's a combination of things, isn't it? Yes. Anyone else has two bits to throw in? I think, I think truly that's the case, that it's, it's almost a case of these darks throwing that negative light forward. You see how it does jump. And these darks throwing that area forward as well. But all of this is too intense and too contrasty. And the moment you cover it, there's a calm. Mm -hmm. It changes completely. Yeah, the mood changes. The mood changes. Mm -hmm. I said early, if you have high contrast in both color and value, mm -hmm. it's difficult to maintain a mood. Mm -hmm. All of this achieves a mood that that violates. Mm -hmm. But as far as a, a modern Christian 
devotional piece, I think this lady does great work. Great work. This is more harmonious all the way. Do you have any comments about the composition? Excuse me? It doesn't really seem like the figures are related to each other. It, it doesn't seem... I think Christ is a bit small, isn't he? I wouldn't know that was supposed to be. Yeah, I think Christ is a bit small and Mary Magdalene is greater than a giant. She is enormous. I think probably Judy had her reasons for doing this. I don't know the particular passage that prompted the painting, but Judy was very interested in the women of the Old and New Testament. And I believe this was Mary Magdalene. Well, this, this really reverses the the focus from Christ to the woman. Right. And you can tell that's what she's interested in. She's interested in what's going on with this woman, just like he's interested. You know, he's looking up at her. She's the most powerful figure. There's a lot of contrasts around her body. So in terms of compositional devices, we've got a dominant vertical, a dominant horizontal, a dominant diagonal. And this curve is sweeping all the way through this, isn't it? Do you feel the game she's playing? Hmm? This curve relates to that, this curve relates to this, this and that read together this and this reads together. In terms of gamut, I don't see one. We have this diagonal, it's repeated in the face. I guess it's repeated here. It is repeated there, isn't it? It's repeated here. This is taking us up along here, but we're it's repeated in all of these situations, isn't it? Do you see it? Yes. There's a coincidence here. Yeah. She's building rhythms. She's moving across. And she's keying it with a blue violet. These are large, large paintings. They really command. And we had an exhibition of them here. And uh, tell me what you find here. Mary Magdalene has discovered that Christ is not in his tomb. He's arisen. She's running to tell the news. So she's pretty joyous, and, and uh, this is what Judy's celebrating. It's kind of weird that her face is darker than a lot of other elements in the painting, because you'd think that would kind of be a focus, but there's less contrast there than in other places. I think Judy would argue that the, the gesturing arm would be the most significant part of the figure. Like be, Excuse me? It doesn't seem like it should be. Well, she's announcing what's happening behind her. No? I agree with you. It could be lightened considerably and be more consistent with the lighting on everything else. No. The lighting is confusing to me. There seems to be an emanating glow from behind the stairs. 
It might be the photograph. Could be. Yeah. Could be. And yet the light on the top of the, each of the steps and the light on the top of her arm, and yet that doesn't seem to translate into her hair quite, or her shoulders. Up. You know, the lighting seems, the source of the light seems a little confusing to me. Yeah, well, this is coming from behind, this is coming mm -hmm. from in front and above. Yeah. But she's having a perfectly wonderful time with all of this movement, you know, and all of these are just repeated, and this is flowing through. And she's playing with a very, very severe diagonal here, and she's playing it in counterpoint against that. This is a way of preventing this from falling out by having this lean in the other direction. It's as if two people are holding hands and they're falling into, and they, they're preventing each other from falling over. This is Dot Bun, and uh, this is a photograph. This is the range of color she used in her triad. And this is yellow pointing down toward where normally we would have red violet. Now she does this all the time. Her orientation of the wheel is different from mine. That doesn't matter. Dot bun and her husband had a, a printing business, which they ran very successfully for years. And during this period, Dot was painting. And gradually, her paintings were selling for more and more money and winning more awards and respect and being shown in more and increasingly important galleries. So Dot and her husband Tom apparently decided, why don't we harness Dot and put her permanently in the studio and Tom will prevent anything from bothering her. He'll shop, he'll cook, he'll house clean. Dot will be the person, person responsible for earning their keep. And they said, let's try it. Probably 20 years ago. It's worked wonderfully well. Dot prices are going up in spite of the economy she's selling. What she does, she has increasingly better galleries carrying her work. And she came to me after she'd been painting for probably 15 years. It was a well-established regional artist. And she studied, she went through the drawing one and then the color course and took figure drawing. And throughout that period, every week when she would come here from New Hope, she would bring her current in hand project and we would discuss it and I would critique it and I would make suggestions and then after she'd been with me for a few years she started teaching and I said what are you teaching? She said well I'm teaching Fletcher, I'm teaching what you taught me about color. She said until I came here I had nothing to teach. I had, I had, I had developed an ability at painting through a hunt and Try, trial method, but I didn't have much to rely upon, and the color is something I can teach, so I'm, I'm teaching, I think she said, Barnstone Light. She said, you're pretty fierce, and you're very much more demanding than I can afford to be on my client, uh, for my clientele. They are not seeking a professional training because this is what they're going to devote their lives to, so as I say, she su suggested that she was doing Barnstone Light. Others have used that phrase too. I have no idea what it means or why, but there you are. In any event, here we have the photograph and then the finished piece and there is the finished piece. Tell me what you find 
worthy of comment about this, people. I don't really know where to look. I don't think it's, I feel like it, there's no focus. I, feel like the, I guess the, that tree in the front could be the focus, but I think the colors behind it are maybe too intense. And I can't, I don't know, it's not strong enough maybe to focus on that tree. Who agrees with Lauren? Seems like everything is a little bit intense. Just in in relation to what's around it. I, I agree with Ron. It doesn't seem like there's any particular place that you should be looking as opposed to another place. Does anyone disagree with them? I see. I agree that it's a busy sort of composition in its detail, but it's not busy in its basic design for me. You know, the, so the diagonal of the water, the vertical of the tree, the tree is clearly a focal point. Um, and I think all of the color and the detail and the brilliance of it For me, it kind of works. I, um, I understand that it's a pretty intense color, but the, the contrast of the sycamore and the shadow, the, the mood in underneath that water is nice. I, I don't dislike this painting. I think it's a little busy for me. It's not restful, but that doesn't appear to be what she was going for. I agree with you. I agree that this is certainly the focal point and it's contrasty enough if you squint to really pop, snap. And uh, everything is warm until we get this quiet cool down here and that cool note there. Do you see it? It's a very warm, brilliantly lit, sunny scene. And it looks like it's either fall it must be fall, but it could be early spring. It could be very early spring. Yeah. And I think that she's darkened the sky very successfully so that it doesn't compete with this light. Many people have light skies. The worst offender in that regard is Hopper. I, I, when I go to, I went to a Whitney show of Hopper's paintings and I had to hold my hand up ahead of me horizontally so I didn't see the skies because they were too intense and the clouds were too light. And the color was wonderful if you didn't have to tolerate those skies, but you don't have to do this here. She has subordinated everything to make this ring. There's a rhythm here that might be a little distracting. That was part of my next comment was maybe that area bothers yeah. me because it distracts from this tree. Yeah. If you cover that, everything is much more. Yeah, I think that's actually what was wrong. Yeah, that's, that's, if there's an error here, I think that's it. This is too intense and it's too contrasty. And that rhythm of all those dots, that's, it, really, it really over, it jumps out of place. It's like the drummer being too loud in the band. Right, right. I don't think we have a photograph here, but we have a series of pieces and then the final. And I think this is much moodier than the other. I think this is more clearly in a red-orange key. And the red-orange is limited to a couple of entries. Do you see it? So a larger percentage of the whole is these icy, icy cools. My goodness, that is cold. Reflection of the sky and the trees and the water. I think that's a handsome piece of painting. 
Now, I wonder if it's followed by, yes, there it is. Yeah. I think it's a, a very, very successful piece. It's interesting that usually you say cools recede and warms move forward, and she's used the cools so much in the foreground. Why, therefore, does it come forward? Perspective. Excuse me? Perspective. No. Um, I think it's because the red orange next to it and the contrast of the very lightest of the snow is forward no, and the contrast no. of that against the darker no 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 why no, does no. why does it come forward what i didn't hear you no no Because it is the most intense color. I didn't hear you. I, well, you said, it, you said it so quietly, I didn't hear you. I, I apologize. You can't hide your light under a bushel or something. This is the most intense color. So cools tend to recede. But if, they, if you want them to come forward, you simply make them sufficiently intense more intense than anything that might push them back and you have the freedom to modify that so we we say warms tend to advance and cools tend to recede but we can reverse that by neutralizing the warms and intensifying the cools and this is what she has done very successfully hmm? and since it's a winter scene and she wants cold She's got ice. I think she's done well. Look at how beautifully she subordinated all of that. There are some docks in here that I think are unfortunate. I'm going to say this might be the photograph. It might be the change of value resulting from their being photographed. This is a major piece. This is a major piece. She's worked on all of these. She's been refining this. Huh? Then she has her final. Looks like this might have been a photograph. She's in a blue violet key. This really sweeps around and disappears out here. The light's coming from behind this and illuminating everything. She's piling up the rocks and leading you into this piece. You know, everything cooperates to bring you through and around. It's good. What do you think? I think it's fine. You better think so. <laughs> do you agree or disagree? It looks abstract to me. That's good. And maybe that's a function of the photograph of the painting. But I get a greater sense of depth from the photograph than I do from the painting itself because She's really dumbed down the value changes in the shadows, those two big blue shadows on the opposite rock wall, you know, across the water. That one and the, the, that one are not nearly as high contrasting value as they are in the photograph. And so I get confused by, um, well, she's I substituted temperature change, you know, color change for value change in my mind. Well, I would find this range of contrast totally unacceptable. Too, yeah. too violent. Mm -hmm. The darks are too dark. There's not enough information in them. The lights are bereft of any texture or information. So that the lights are overexposed, the shadows are underexposed. My reading of Ansel Adams, who I had most respect for with regard to his writing on photography and his ability to guarantee you the perfect negative and the perfect print. I think his design is terrible. But uh, he said all of your shadows should have enough reflected light and detail. They shouldn't go black. And your light should never become white paper. 
They should always have texture. Well, this violates all of that, but it doesn't matter because it's given her the pond, the pooling, the stream running through, the light coming from the side and illuminating the back. I think she turned this into a harmonious, quiet, nocturnal sort of piece. And I think it's quite uh, admirable to take something as raw and disjointed and unorganized as that and end up with something <coughs> that sounds like a, a very quiet piece of music, you know? And, the, you know, she's working with close rela closely related values and temperature changes. Yeah, and, she definitely quieted the whole thing. Oh, yeah. And this is, well, I think we have to respect her purpose. Mm -hmm. It's not what we would have done, but did what she do seem to work with regard to what it appears she wished to do? I think she's achieved her goal. I think very successfully. I feel like the rocks in the front are a little, they're distracting me kind of because they're a little bit too intense. So they distract me from the water. Yeah, but they're advancing and that's what she wants. She wants you to enter here and be drawn, not on this, this diagonal, but here, along this arc. And all of this is sweeping. Do you see it? Everything is taking you around. But we come in on the Baroque diagonal and we swing all the way through it. I think it's extremely successful and wonderfully unified. And the organization of all of these overlapping planes carrying you back and being reduced in detail as they dissolve into the light Mm, and this lovely reverse curve here, too. Lovely, lovely movement. A lot of movement. And it's controlled. And it's all quiet neutrals. Mm. She's in charge. This is not a route two. Oh, I see what she's doing. She's overlapping a route two here and a route two there. Do you see it? There's her route twos. And She's blocking in her lights and her dots and developing them. Ultra, I think this is one, two, three. And now she's ready with the underpainting. And here she's showing us how she's swinging compasses. Can you see those? Compasses all the way through. And certainly it dances, doesn't it? And this, this recession along the road to disappear into the background, the darkening of the sky, the autumn leaves, it's full of movement. And that tree stabilizes everything, doesn't it? And it looks like it's on the rebated square. And this is all on the 45 degree angle of the rebated square, as is that and this. Was there another one? There it is, yeah. This is a little out of focus. I'm sorry about that. That's a lot to organize. That's an awful lot to organize. And I had a hand in some of this. But she's really very much in charge of what she's up to. She goes crashing into the distance, doesn't she? Hmm? Look at those neutrals. And then she's formalized the stream. Mm -hmm. 
pure abstraction, pure device, playing with that diagonal, running all the way back, cutting this through, rhythmic all the way through, and sweeping through again off to the left. Lovely color. Playing with this again. Contra jour, against the sun, against the day, against the light. It's the most dramatic lighting situation the painter or the photographer can address, and it's one of the most challenging and difficult. So here's her photograph. Here's her grisaille. Now she's coming over and much more unified than that, isn't it? Done some wonderful things with the, the foliage on those fir trees. And she's controlled the pattern of lights coming through where before they popped in a few instances. Here's, here she's absolutely in charge. Absolutely in charge. And in terms of movement, good grief. There's an enormous amount of movement, isn't there? She's played all of her parallels, reverse curves. And the key color. So she's showing you all of her arabesques, her, her linear directions, her grids, the patterning, again the photograph, and then the final. I think this is a little out of focus, but I think it's one of the less successful of the lot. She's keying it with these blues. Pretty challenging subject. Is her sky a bit too intense? I think it's quiet enough in value to key these warms. She's doing some gutsy things back here. That's the distracting part for me is the sky. Well, you eliminate it, and then some of these schools start to roar. Yeah. But Very challenging, very, very challenging subject. She's, she's coming through on the Baroque diagonal. She's compass swinging her way all the way through here. That is pretty intense. I think that um, it closes this class very nicely. Up to now, we've been working theoretically. I thought this would be an ideal way to close one of my courses, which sets out, because its title is Color Control, to provide you with a palette that you really have authority over, a range of colors that you can choose from intelligently, and organize into a suitable ensemble. Know where to mix and how to mix, how to underpaint and overpaint. If those of you who wish to continue with me with painting, continue coming in on a Thursday afternoon in independent study, or on a Monday night or a Thursday night when I have life class, I can give you still life undertakings that will allow you to apply all of this information. And if you're working on projects at home, you will have an opportunity then to bring them in and have me gently discuss them with you. But for a while, this would allow you to get up to speed choosing your own personal subject matter and developing a body of work based on understanding systems that you can rely upon and all the information we've covered.
So that's the purpose of this. It's an introduction to color control. It's an introduction to the control palette. It's an introduction to Frank Morley Fletcher's contribution that was so incredibly valuable to me as a student and has served my students so admirably. Remember, when John Mason gave me this little book in the Anchor Pub at the end of Kingston Road in Oxford in probably 1959, long before any of you were born, <laughs> he asked one thing. He said, Myron, promise me you'll share this. Well, I've been teaching it now for over 45 years. And when you look at the color by the students who've studied with me on the website, you can see how confident they are and how differently they all paint, which is what pleases me the most, that nothing looks like a rubber stamp. Everybody's personality informs their work. So that brings us, yes, go ahead. I was wondering about working in a different medium. I would like to try this in pastels. Um, is how, how different is it, how difficult is it to mix the colors across? And, you know, is, is, past, is oil pastel a viable? I think, I think that Sid is using, too much too soon. no, Sid, Sid is working, I think, in, traditional pastels, not oil pastels. Okay. I don't know, but I think that the traditional pastel artist would think oils pastel maybe is uh, not all that respectable. I don't know. I do know Sid is one respect as a pastel artist and an outstanding one. And I know she grinds up a lot of her pastel chalks and mixes, and mixes the values for the background and applies them, I think, with brushes mm -hmm. and dusts them until she has the kind of half tone she wants to work into. The, the one who's on the other side of this wall here, she's doing the pastel? No, those are oils. Those are oils. That's Judy Fritchman, whose work I showed this evening. No, you can chat with mm -hmm. Sid. She'd be mm -hmm. delighted to sit down and talk with you, show you her work make recommendations. Sure, there's no reason why you can't work in pastel. Do oils upset your system? No, no. <laughs> I just worked in pastels years ago and, and enjoyed it very much. And, and come to think of it, it was not oil pastel, it was traditional no. pastels. So. Well, there, I ask because there are people who find that the chemis chemicals in oil cross them to break out. It bothers everybody else in the house but me. Well, good, good, good. <laughs> Anyway, that's it. That's the course. That's the color. And now it's up to you. But if you wish me to be of some use, I'm here. And we can make some arrangement. So I thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. And gentlemen, I thank you for being here.